Hello and welcome to this special broadcast. I'm Kenneth Ibomo and on this show, a special youth panel will join me to explore how Africa and Europe's partnership should look in a post-COVID-19 world. Uh, no doubt the COVID-19 pandemic has shown how interconnected we are on the planet and more importantly, how we should seize the shared opportunities ahead to tackle the common challenges we face. But Africa and Europe have had a long history defined by an asymmetry of power and economic equality. So how do we level the playing field and ensure that both continents get the best out of this reformed partnership? Let's hear uh, from the thoughts of some interesting young people on this. African partnership to me is an avenue for mutual exchange of ideas, of support and resources needed for both continents to thrive. The COVID-19 crisis has simplified the discriminations and brought new challenges and I think we must take it as an opportunity to rebuild. Young people have proven to be an invaluable resource when it has come to the response and management of the COVID-19 pandemic at the grassroots level. I would like to see African youth having the same chances as European youth. And that means the creation of fair and future-proof jobs. Free movement of people, improved trade relations, and the sharing of technical knowledge. I consider Europe and Africa partnership as a milestone for addressing future global challenges such as climate change and the health crisis, and for ensuring sustainable development. We need an inclusive um, accountability and transparency framework where both EU and African leaders can hold each other accountable. I want to see a mutual exchange of ideas, knowledge, and opportunities. I'd like to see an EU-AU partnership that encourages governments in Africa, especially in Nigeria, to invest more funds into the health and education sector. To economically empower women specifically by making sure that they have access to the STEM job fields. And ensure that we have the right skills, the right knowledge, and the right manpower to drive health care to the fullest in, the, in both continents. I want the digital gap between Africa and Europe to be bridged in terms of infrastructure, access, skills, and literacy. The potentials are huge in Africa due to its youthful population. Europe-Africa partnership means a lot to me. These two continents have been in partnership for years, way before I was born. And even in the light of the events globally, it is even more pertinent that this partnership goes a step further. And most importantly, I would like to see that youths are always on the deciding table. Together we can do this. Now, the voice of the young people must be heard as it is certainly the hope our collective futures depend on. So let's set the ball rolling and let me introduce my panelists for today. Starting with Obina Onoa, he's a public health professional and one activist. I also have Anna Nepenberg, she's a master's student in economics and a one activist as well. Damilola Denero is a writer and policy advocate and a one activist. And Eleanor Batile is a M&A candidate and in international affairs and also a one activist. Thank you so much uh, for joining me, uh, ladies and gentlemen, on this, uh, this interesting panel today. But I'd like to get start off to, yes, I understand, yes, your titles are there, but I'd like to get a little insight into who you are uh, so we can get the ball rolling. Let me start with Obina. Okay, hi, everyone. Yes. Um I'm a public health professional based in Abuja, Nigeria. Uh, I've been working in public health for the last five years, and that has been my passion. I currently reside in Abuja, and I'm from the southeastern part of Nigeria. So I am, I am Igbo by ethnic, ethnicity, sorry. Thank you. All right, then let me bring Anna here. Hello, um, I am Hanna, I'm German but I currently work for the One Campaign in the Brussels office. Where I'm currently completing a master in economic analysis and European policy. And I'm very happy to be on the show to you, uh, today to talk to you. All right, Damilola. Uh, thank you, Kenneth. My name is Damilola Dinero. Uh, I'm a writer and policy advocate from Nigeria. Um, I write and advocate on issues such as poverty and conflict, unemployment and digitalization, as well as good governance and your fight uh, interrelated. Uh, in 2018, I won the Peace Right Now Prize from the Embassy of Ireland, and last year I won the Block for the Everybody Contest organized by the World Bank, and I 
also started getting involved with one campaign last year as a champion of the transition to an activist. This year, I've been involved a lot on the Europe-Africa partnership, um, holding several youth-led talks with EU and EU representatives. Uh, we've talked on issues such as infrastructure, economy, trade, COVID, and I'm really happy to be here today to highlight some of these issues further. Thank you. All right, then, let me bring in Eleanor here. Um, thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Eleanor. I am French, but I'm based currently in Germany. I'm a master's student in international affairs, and I'm really interested in topics of international development, trade, and climate change. Um, I've had the chance to live in the UK, in Germany, in France, and in Belgium, so I would say I'm a European at heart. Um, and yes, I'm really excited to be here today. All right, now let me pose the first question to you, Eleanor, and as we're looking at this, uh, this partnership that we're looking at between Africa and Europe and, and how we want it to look like in a post-COVID-19 world, I want to understand for you, why should uh, the EU and European and African leaders uh, prioritize a new, renewed partnership for Africa and, and Europe at, at a time like this in the context of the global pandemic? Um, thank you. So as you said in the introduction, I think what's really important is first to say the COVID crisis really showed how inter interconnected we are and also showed that without a global response to global challenges like currently the health pandemics, we're not going anywhere and countries cannot act in silos. So I think right now what's really important to realize is we're at the crossroads. We've just had a really important health pandemic or well, it's still going ongoing, but we will have other challenges in the future. So we really need to tackle these together and I think it's a great opportunity, this uh, partnership, to rethink the way um, both continents, the, the relationship between these continents, to really bring it to a win-win situation and really think about mutual solutions to tackle together um, and not move beyond this donor and recipient relationship that we might have had in the past. All right, and let me bring in Obin as well. Obin, I'm posing the same question to you as well, because I'd also like to get a perspective as well from someone in, in, in Nigeria, Abuja, uh, who, um, for you, though, looking at this partnership, why should we uh, prioritize this partnership at a time like this? Thank you, Kenneth. Um, so, yes, to all my viewers listening out there, welcome. Um, first of all, we've been hearing about the expression, how the world is a global village. And the COVID-19 pandemic, really brought to light how close and interconnected we all are. And it just goes to show us that we are only as strong as our weakest health link. So basically the COVID-19 pandemic made us realize that no one is safe until everyone is safe. And it has upended so many social and economic activities. For instance, African leaders were supposed to meet in 2020, sometime in October this year. But as a result of the pandemic, it has been postponed till next year. And this is just one of so many activities that have been affected. We definitely need a different approach. Health systems need to be strengthened. And I'm trying to base this argument for a new partnership on health. We need to make health a permanent priority going forward in this new partnership because it underpins everything that we do in terms of employment, job creation, social activities, you name it. We can only be healthy before we can be able to achieve what we want to do. And so going forward, when we talk about the partnership, we know that the multilateralism and the cooperation are key to progress. However, this still needs to change. There still needs to be a fine tuning. And I'll give an example very briefly. The EU has an official development assistance, which it gives to countries to help them in the systems. But in 2018, only 2.8% of that ODA, the official development assistance, went to health. This is very poor. We need the financing to be able to do that, especially in the light of the events that are happening globally. And then on the African side, we had African leaders commit in Abuja in 2001, called the Abuja Declaration, that they would commit 15% of the total budgets to health. But right now, as I speak to you right here in Abuja, the seat of where this treaty was signed, Nigeria has not crossed 6% of its total budget to health. 
the, the, the maximum we've ever reached, which was in 2012, was just 5.9%. I mean, this is a business really small. So, I mean, it, it, and all this goes to show you that our health systems are worse off as a result. These needs to change. So it's not just from the EU, but it's also from the African counterparts as well. And I'm really looking forward to a renewal in this partnership. The idea is that Africa has the wealth, but we need Africa, we need help so that Africa can be able to capitalize on the wealth that it already has. And we're looking at Europe as partners in achieving this. And I'm really happy for the postponement of the meeting as well, because this will give time for our African leaders and European leaders to really sit, uh, reflect, and reevaluate this partnership going forward. Thank you. All right, then. Interesting insights there from um, Obina. Hannah, Obina says we should prioritize health. Uh, for you, though, when you look at this new uh, partnership for you, what is important to you and, and how should we prioritize? Actually, I agree with Obina that health has to be one of the major priorities of this renewed EU-Africa partnership. Because as he said, health is so much more than just health. It really is connected to everything we do. Now we're in a global pandemic, but it's not just affecting our health, it's, it's, it's affecting our economy. Uh, it's related to issues on, of environmental destructions, etc. And it's also linked to gender equality. That might be very interesting for our younger listeners, because actually women are 1.8 times more likely to lose their job. Um, in this pandemic right now, women are more likely to be taken out of education at a young age. So prioritizing health is really important because we don't want another crisis where we can only react to. We want a future that is strong, that gives lots of opportunities to the youth on both of our continents instead of just having politics that react to issues that we could have tackled way earlier on, but that we just didn't manage to tackle. Thank you. All right, now, Damilala, for you, though, what is important and how should we go about this? Um, I quite agree with the previous speakers that uh, health is important. So I also think uh, another critical issue to really look at is the uh, issue of job creation. The population of Africa is rapidly increasing. Uh, by 2050, we expect the population to double. And this means that there are going to be a lot of young people uh, entering into the labor market, and there will, there will be a demand for jobs. Uh, already, to meet this demand, we need to be creating about 22.5 million jobs over the next 15 years. But we are only managing to create uh, 10 million jobs. And the concept of unemployment is changing a bit because typically unemployment will uh, mean that there are no jobs for people to do, but we are going to see that in the digital economy, there will be jobs that uh, people just don't have the right skills to, to take up. So our governments in Europe and Africa must really prioritize investment in digital skills, uh, also digital infrastructure. A study by the World Bank showed that um, increasing uh, broadband penetration by 10% can accelerate growth by 1.38%. And a similar study by uh, Chomas University of Technology uh, also showed that doubling broadband penetration can boost the GDP by 0.3%. Uh, another key area where digitalization can help is the informal sector, because 66% of uh, the workers in sub-Saharan Africa are in this sector, but it is often treated as a regulatory failure by uh, the authorities. But I think digitalization can help businesses in the informal sector to be more competitive by optimizing their operations and uh, productivity, which will help them to scale up, create more jobs, and then transit into the formal economy where they can contribute more actively to the economy. Uh, I think this is a better approach than uh, any draconian enforcement. Generally, the government must create the right business climate for businesses to thrive small and medium skilled enterprises, startups, uh, to provide easy access to credit. Uh, this is the future, but the future, the so-called future of work has come even sooner with COVID-19 because COVID has changed how we work, how we conduct business, how we do our meetings. Digital jobs and digital platforms have gained a greater prominence and 
a lot of individuals and institutions have been left behind. Uh, I will just conclude by saying, for me, the, the issue of job creation is not just uh, an economic matter. The very survival of our continent can depend on this, because if you have so many people, so many young people coming up, you need to give them jobs to do, as they say, and I do mind the devil's workshop. So if you don't provide that with jobs, it will have consequences for the security and stability of our continent. We could be sitting on a ticking time bomb if we do not um, address this issue quickly and decisively. All right, a very articulated uh, way of put, putting things together according to, uh, from all the, the panelists so far. And it's interesting that if we are really going to get to the root of understanding what we want to prioritize, we should understand what the what the current challenges or what we're facing is between Africa and Europe. And and in that in that line, let me start with Eleanor here and trying to understand, you know, what, what you, you think are the current current shortfalls in that relationship between Africa and Europe and how we can, you know, um, balance things out and not tilt the scale to either either of the continents. Um, thank you, Kenneth. Well I'd say um, so to build on everything that was said in the past um, one of the challenge has been seeing the relationship between Europe and Africa as this donor and recipient relationship. Um, and that has done many harms in the past. Um, if you look at the way we trade between doc the different doc continents, if you look at the way some businesses practice in Africa, it has done an almost uh, damages to people's livelihoods and to the environment. So I think if we if we look at job creation and economic partnership for the for this uh, UN Africa partnership, what would be great there is to um, establish fair business practices in the private sector because as we said in the past, more investment doesn't really translate into inclusive and sustainable growth, and that's what we need on both continents. We need to create decent jobs, as uh, Demidela said, and for this, I think we need more transparency because this lack of transparency has done harms on both continents. So if you look, for example, one challenge in Europe we've had right now is thinking about how we're gonna tackle climate change. And one idea that's being put forward in terms of decarbonizing transport is electric vehicles. But in these electric vehicles, what you need is batteries. One really important resource for the batteries is cobalt. And cobalt, has been linked with human rights violations in certain countries where it's been extracted. For example, in Congo, it's linked with child slavery. It's also linked with um, water usage, like communities not being able to use water. So there, I think it's a real challenge. And what we need more is more accountability and more transparency in terms of the, the way businesses handle between both countries. In terms of trade, I think what's really important to move beyond this donor and recipient relationship is to see, to see it as a win-win situation, to recognize the growth that there is in Africa and to put it on the equal footing uh, with Europe. So that would be, for instance, by boosting African manufacturing, helping Africa export more valuable uh, products. So for example, now the EU is revising its trade policies this year. It could really help by supporting the uh, African continental free trade area. Um, one issue with trade that we've seen during the pandemic, for example, in the pharmaceutical sector, we realized that Europe and Africa were both really dependent on China and India for the imports of, of some products, for instance, masks and um, respiratory machines. And that was, um, we had an initial shortage at the beginning because of the lack of these trade relations and the fact that we're dependent on other countries to import. So I think these are real challenges and we already have some ideas about how we can improve it through the partnership. Mm. Thank you for, that, for summing that up uh, so nicely, um, um, Eleanor. Let me get um, Obina's thoughts on this as well and, and what you think the current shortfalls are uh, in this relationship and how we can um, level things out. Thank you again, Kenneth. Um, so for me, speaking already and drawing, drawing points from what uh, Eleanor has said, I would also like to see a partnership between Africa and Europe in which we are more equal partners. So just like she said about this donor-recipient relationship, this needs to be scrapped. It needs to be jettisoned. 
we now have to consider each other as equal partners on the table. And when we talk about this leadership, one shortfall that really stands out for me is about how you can integrate the voices of your citizens and young people. So it's not just about having our leaders have a sit down and talk about issues. How do we also tap and draw from the wealth of knowledge of the indigenous that are back home, our, our constituencies, our communities back at home? Everyone should have a voice and there should be, there should be mechanisms in which our voices can be channeled to our leaders so that they understand what are the specific needs of the people. And then this can be brought to light. It's not just about saying, oh, you people from a certain community need such, need this. You need a health system or you need tap water. You need to get the ideas of the people and they can give you those ideas. You will be surprised at the amount of knowledge, the wealth of knowledge that people and young people actually have as well. So basically what I'm saying is we need to listen to our citizens, hear their voices, and of course, young people as well. We make up majority of the population in Sub-Saharan Africa. We are about more than 60% of the population in Africa, young people basically, from about 15 to 35. And that is a huge wealth of people. And still coming back to the whole thing, I, I like to draw all my discussions around health, and I just want to try and put a word to my colleague, Damilola. Yes, the jobs are, are very important. However, remember that if you're not healthy, you cannot be able to take up on that job that you need. And I'll give one example. It's about maternal deaths. The WHO, the World Health Organization, states that maternal death is a very strong indicator of our social, uh, police, uh, population health and socioeconomic development. But Nigeria, for instance, contributes 20% of total deaths, maternal deaths globally. That is a very huge number in just one country. And we're in Africa. But of course, we have better health systems in Europe and we don't seem to hear that. This is very glaring. You need that to be fixed. And we do know that when we have better health, we can be able to have a healthier workforce. And when we have a healthier workforce, that can translate to healthier economies. So basically, let's get our young people involved. Let's get the citizens on the deciding table, and then we can be able to make health a priority, which underpins everything that we talk about in this re new relationship going forward, especially in the light of the pandemic. Thank you. Mm, thank you, Obena. Yes, so health definitely very important. Uh, you need to be healthy before you can get jobs, and we need to get young people involved. Let me bring Anna here as well and understand your perspective to things. I think that it, one of the biggest shortfalls for me right now is that all countries in the COVID pandemic just had the immediate reaction to, to lock their borders, to close up, to isolate, when what we actually need is increased cooperation. And this really hasn't been happening between the European Union and Africa. So although Africa and Europe are national partners, we haven't been working together properly. We certainly haven't been working together on a level playing field. But we know that we can't do this alone. The future challenges really call for cooperation, for collaboration. We have seen that this pandemic doesn't know any borders and neither will future issues like climate change. So it's really about rebalancing this relationship by understanding the importance of health, by listening to the contribution, by, the, by listening to the contributions of young people like us and true balance to make this partnership work for millions of young people for the future. Thank you. All right, uh, uh, interesting, interesting viewpoints there. And, and it's important that we also know that uh, the African population is expanding. And uh, I'd like to bring in Damilola into this uh, and ask you this question because, you know, earlier, um, Obi and Ahelia said that uh, you need first to be healthy before you can get the jobs that you need. But what should leaders be doing to create these new jobs uh, uh, for the next generation? Uh, thank you for the question. I think. Um, African leaders and European leaders can cooperate a lot on this issue. 
uh, Africa and Europe have really come a long way. Uh, the relationship is over a century old, and Europe remains uh, one of the largest uh, trading partners and donor of Africa. In 2017, 36% uh, of the exports in Africa uh, ended up in Europe. But the issue is that the dynamics is changing a bit in terms of population. Like I mentioned before, the population of Africa is rapidly increasing, while the population of Europe is uh, declining. Uh, by the middle of this century, we would expect 20% of the world population to be African and just 5% to be uh, European. And so there's a shift in the market, and I think a lot of the opportunities and market is going to uh, come to Africa. Uh, so I think that's where the main focus should really be. And African leaders uh, really need to prioritize uh, the adaptable solutions to, to the issue of uh, unemployment and job creation. Uh, it is not just uh, okay to copy and paste uh, a model in Europe without considering the peculiarities we have in Africa. Uh, in terms of the, our socioeconomic uh, level at the moment. So I think um, the government must provide uh, the enabling environment. Uh, it should be easier to, to do business. Uh, also, I think they also need to provide a good regulatory framework for digitalization to thrive, because I think this is the key. I'll give you an example of Nigeria, where the digital economy can potentially create Three million jobs over a very short span. What is the size of the Nigerian civil service? Uh, some government actors a few years ago put that number between 800,000 to uh, 1.2 million. So the jobs are going to be in the digital economy, but uh, sometimes the regulatory framework we have in Africa is quite restrictive. Uh, for a continent with limited access to digital uh, technology data is quite expensive in africa if you look at the data and the minimum wage across the continent it's, it's one of the most expensive in the world uh you have government uh, over taxing the sector with limited investment in the sector and so this has not done a lot to encourage uh private sector so i i think basically in the nutshell the environment must be created the enabling environment, the enabling laws that will help uh, digitization to thrive, that will help startups to thrive. And um, uh, putting all this together, we, uh, Africa is, is, is really the, uh, like Ovina said, there's a lot of riches in the continent that can be exploited, but uh, the government needs to do better in terms of regulatory framework and in terms of basic infrastructure. So much can happen in terms of job creation if you just I give people constant power, access to internet, and um, uh, access to credit facilities. So I, I, I think the government must really begin to rethink this, else we will lose uh, the opportunity we're going to, we're supposed to enjoy uh, because of our population uh, in the future. Thank you. All right, and thanks so much uh, for that, uh, Damilola. At this point, I just need you all to hold that thought for a second. I will take a quick break, and when we return, we're going to be talking about uh, the main opportunities we can expect uh, from this uh, reformed partnership. Welcome back to a special broadcast as we explore how Africa and Europe's partnership should look in a post-COVID-19 world. And my guests so far have been Obina Onwa, is a public health professional and one activist. I also have Anna Neipenberg, she's a master's student in economics and a one activist as well. I also have Dami Lola Adeniro, he's a writer and policy advocate and also a one activist. And Eleanor Batile, who is a m and candidate in international affairs, and she's also a one activist. Now we're going to be talking about opportunities, and I'm going to throw the floor first uh, to Obina, and let's get to understand what the main opportunities uh, that African and European uh, leaders uh, should address in, the, in this uh, new partnership. Thank you once again, Kenneth. Um, so uh, just to rephrase the question again, the opportunities that African and European leaders should address in their partnership, correct? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, yes. 
Um, so for me, um, I, I want to try and, and deviate from my main area, which is health. I've been speaking about health, which is very, it, it shouldn't be taken for granted, but I would like to single out one specific area that I think holds a lot of potential and actually speaks in, in, in line with what Danielala has been saying. And that is the area of technology. We, I, I believe that Europe has advanced their technology very, very well. I mean, they've gotten to the stage where systems work. Is it in transportation, even in health, uh, in automobiles, and in, in basically in their industries? This is where I feel that, or I believe that the sharing of technical knowledge will greatly improve and support Africa to be able to capitalize on the wealth that it already has. So technology for me should be that main opportunity. And I'll just give a few examples. For instance, according to The Economist, The Economist says that solar farms and onshore wind power stations are a clean source of new energy, new electricity. And this has the potential to generate power for at least two thirds of the world's population. Two thirds, that is very significant. That's like 66% of the world. So this is somewhere that is quite untapped in Africa and we really need that, that support. And I'll just give a little more example once again. In Kenya, we've had the story where an NGO uh, built a solar farm and that farm was able to convert salt water into clean water for the locality. This is just one example. In Nigeria, we have abundant sunshine. As I speak to you right now, looking at my window, there's abundant sunshine, like we have it in excess. This can be tapped, but I don't recall if there's a place where we have a solar farm that is, that is built into the national grid for electricity. And Nigeria's electricity has, has, has been substandard, to be honest. So we need this kind of technology. And coming back to water, again, just to give you a slight information as to how all this is interconnected in terms of technology, in terms of health, in terms of job creation, just like Danny Lola said, if you have clean water, clean, you, you can imagine how, uh, for instance, in developed countries in Europe, clean water is readily accessible that it might even be taken for granted. But that's not the same in, in, in low income countries, especially in Africa. We have communities that are struggling with water. It's very hard to find. And even the resources that they have, it's very, very unsafe to drink. And in those situations, that is where you have diseases. They thrive, people get sick. And then you now talk of how can they get to a nearest health system to get the health that they need when it's practically not there. But just having clean water alone can turn the tide on the health of populations. In COVID-19, water is very paramount to tackling it. Because when you tell people that you need to wash your hands with soap and water, the water has to be available in the first place. They need to have the clean water to, to make their meals and, 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 and thrive on whatever little resources they have. So coming back to the, to, to the question, technology plays a very important opportunity that African and European leaders should consider in this partnership going forward. And of course, it, has, it, it creates sort of like a virtuous cycle a virtuous cycle because it all feeds into everything that we talk about. So this is technology for me is one area that they should focus on in the partnership. Thank you. All right, thanks for that, Obina. Anna Obina says technology, we should harness the sun in Africa. Uh, we should get the solar farms running um, to get cleaner energy, uh, to get even better water. For you though, what opportunities do you see in this partnership? Personally, I see a very great chance to meaningful, meaningfully engage youth, like youth voices in this renewed Africa-Europe partnership. Um, and this can include supporting uh, Africa-Europe youth forum to even facilitate intercontinental dialogue between youth, as well as provide uh, financial support to youth centers, youth-led organization, community centers, OBA, for increased civic engagement and youth engagement in the EU-Africa partnership. And really for me, integrating, that young, integrating young people in the EU-Africa partnership and making sure that they're also represented at the AU-EU summit is really important to me because it's a way for them and for us to highlight 
Africa's strength and the opportunities and their resources. So like Ubina just said, young people are very um, thrilled by the idea of accelerating the digitalization in many different areas, public administration, for example. So if we don't include youth enough, how are we going to be able to hear those voices? So let's take this opportunity and really focus on what the youth needs, how we can help them and how we can develop a successful partnership around opportunities for youth. Thank you. All right, the interest in there first from Obina who says technology should be prioritized. Now Anna says we should engage youth voices and form those international dialogues. Damilola, what it is for you? Um, for me, I think this new partnership really needs to capture the concept of balance. Uh, the truth is, Africa has come of age, and you know, a lot of my colleagues have talked about donor-recipient uh, relationship. We need to transit uh, this kind of relationship, you know, the, the master-servant mentality that might have been entrenched during uh, the colonial era, which happened many years ago. I think a new partnership must uh, kickstart the movement from dependency to interdependency uh, because we actually need each other. And specifically, I think one area where we can strengthen, especially in Africa, is uh, building strong institutions and not uh, strong men uh, because it really takes institutions for things to, to work. In Europe, for instance, uh, it does not matter who uh, the person in office of course, we'll have some power, but the institution is always uh, stronger. Uh, but in Africa, we seem to like uh, promote strong men and not strong institutions. And one key way to, to strengthen our institutions, uh, for instance, I think two institutions should, should be at the forefront of this. The electoral institutions, we must have um, free and credible elections um, across Africa. The people must always have their way. The majority must always have their way. Uh, because I, I think when people in, in, in office know that they can actually be voted out uh, uh, credibly, uh, they will see better governance. Uh, um, also, the second is anti-corruption institutions. And I think Europe also needs to do a lot. Uh, it, 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 it's not just uh, having European institutions give us um, index on transparency and, and all that, because we see a lot of uh, wealth transfer illicit wealth transfer from Africa to Europe. And so I think these two continents must really commit uh, to transparency. Institutions that promote transparency must be strengthened. Institutions that promote um, electoral credibility must be strengthened. And institutions that promote uh, human rights, fundamental human rights. I think uh, going forward, we should not have statements uh, such as uh, there's freedom of speech, but no freedom after speech. So the institutions that should safeguard our human rights, that should safeguard our vote, uh, must be strengthened uh, going forward. All right, quite a lot said there by uh, Damilola talking about capturing that concept of balance uh, and transiting from the master servant uh, narrative, also uh, moving from uh, dependency to interdependency and building stronger institutions there. Eleanor, for you, um, what is it for you, and uh, what main opportunities do you see in the in the in, in this Africa European uh, leaders uh, to to uh, how do you can address this uh, new partnership? Um, thank you. So all the other fellow activists already said so much, and everything was on point. Um, I think I can just build on um, what Obina was referring to in terms of technologies in renewable uh, energy. Um, I would say as as both continents are now trying to build back better after the crisis, uh, which means building back in a way which is trying to tackle uh, poverty issues, social inequality, but also climate change, to make sure that we are more prepared for the next crisis that we will face. Um, I think it's crucial to think about the partnership in terms of better, first better investment opportunities between Europe and Africa and renewable energy, exactly as uh, Ubina said, Africa is a renewable energy king and there's so much untapped potential. And I think this is a great opportunity um, for both continents to really grow this potential together. 
I would also say this is a great opportunity for both continents to finally work together on meeting the global targets that we've set for ourselves. For instance, the, the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Agreement, the world is not on track to meet these objectives. And I think through this partnership, if we do it in a clever way, if we do it really people-centered, we can little by little be on track towards meeting these, uh, these goals that we've set for ourselves. Um, and I think, let me go back to the, the COVID building back better um, and thinking about it in terms of green recovery. This is great in terms of job creation as well. Uh, so that goes back into what uh, Damila was highlighting in terms of the need to create jobs. Thank you. All right, let me start with you, Eleanor, on, on this next question. And if you could ask African and European leaders uh, to do one thing differently, uh, what would this be? Um, I would say involve the youth meaningfully in the discussions. That's already a point that was uh, mentioned by all the, uh, my fellow activists, but I think this is crucial because in the past, the youth have been somewhat kind of used as a marketing strategy by some politicians. We are invited uh, to the discussions, but then what we say is never being really followed up upon. And I think this is really a crucial time. And I think actually politicians in the EU and Africa have realizing the power of youth, that this is really a time for youth to be invited at the table. So it would be great to have the youth actually invited to the EU and EU, um, Af African Union and European Union summits so that their voices can be heard. Um, I think this is a great opportunity to foster a civic engagement because educated youth are educated citizens. So if you give them the chance to be involved at the discussions, they will be interested in these matters. And at the end of the day, the EU and Africa partnership concerns us. It's the way we want to shape a future. So if I'd ask them one thing, it's really to give a meaningful participation to the youth and be able to follow up on the, on the feedback they get. All right, now let me bring in Obina here as well. And Obina, if you were to ask uh, that one question to the leaders in Africa and Europe, what would that be? Yeah, so the thing that I would want African leaders and European leaders to do differently would to take on the mentality of having a shared prosperity. And by that, I mean sort of like your interests are my interests. This is how we all feed into each other together. Like I said from the beginning, we are so interconnected as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. So it will take just a reshaping of our thoughts and to realize that we are doing this based on our mutual benefit. It's a shared, it's a shared prosperity as equal partners. And I would like this to be based on the values of integrity, diversity, competence, and gender equality. We need to have the integrity to get things done, follow, sort of walk the talk and not, not, not leave it to documents that we've signed and we just part our ways. We need to see accurate, uh, concrete action that has been taken down to the grassroots level. Diversity, Africa and Europe, we are so diverse in our cultures. These strengths can be brought together on the table, including youth, young people, and of course, getting everyone to really participate in this. In terms of the competence, we need the right people to take up the positions that make the difference. The policy makers, the decision makers, we need competent people on deck. Then we talk about gender equality. Women have long shown that they have what it takes to lead and to help. So, I mean, you can give examples. For instance, Dr. Okonjo Iwala, who was just recently awarded the Forbes Africa CNBC Person of the Year. She is the chair of Gavi and she has been doing very well. And she, she, even, she even dedicated the award to all the many people who have actually suffered as a result of COVID. I mean, this is the kind of selfless leadership that we're talking about when we're talking about you know, shared prosperity. So we can go on and on, but this is what I'm looking at, the shared prosperity mentality based on these four values, integrity, competence, diversity, and gender equality. Thank you. All right, and uh, well put there, Obina. Uh, let me get Anna's uh, take on this as well. What's that question you would ask these leaders? I would ask European and African leaders 
to be proactive instead of reactive and to dream big in this new partnership. Be ambitious. This is a wonderful chance to shape the future of so many people in such a wonderful way. But for this, we really need to acknowledge that investment in prevention is much more efficient than later on tackling the issues that could we that we could have dealt with much earlier on. And I know I've said this before, but it's really important because as a young person, it gets very frustrating seeing politicians continue to talk about issues and continue to talk about issues and not finding a solution. And then, you know, you will have to grow up with those issues when there are existing solutions. We're seeing it right now with the COVID pandemic. We have found an, a vaccine in such a short amount of time because everyone actually came together and worked on it together. What if we would put the same amount of research and development and funding into other diseases? I would like to see just a bit more of this, um, of this future thinking from politicians and then actually acting on those things because it's our future we're talking about and it's the future we are going to be living in. And I want this to be a good future for all of us on both continents. Thank you very much, Kenneth. All right, well, Damilala, what would you like to be done differently? Uh, for me, not business as usual. The one thing I would ask EU, European Union and African Union leaders to do is to set up a more sophisticated accountability mechanism. We need strong systems that will check our progress or lack of it it's not enough to have summits um, every now and then and come up with lofty targets and give press releases and make it a whole media affair. But we need to constantly evaluate if we are meeting targets, if we are making progress. Uh, the young people of Africa and Europe are watching keenly. We are interested and we will demand for accountability. And I'm really happy to have this kind of platform for young people to also engage. And this is the point that we are indeed closely monitoring our events and there must be accountability. All right, then, uh, Damilo, interesting you put it that way. So let's get into uh, your call to action here because at the end of the day, we need actionable points. We need things to get done. And uh, uh, let me start with Eleanor here. And uh, Eleanor, I'd like to get what your call to, to action is for the European and African leaders. Thank you, Kenneth. Um, I'd say to make it simple, again, involve the youth on the table. Uh, involve the youth in the next uh, European uh, African Union and EU summit. Uh, listen to their feedback and invest more into youth exchanges. All right, there. Uh, let me get um, uh, Obin as a call to action. Yes, thank you again, Kenneth. Um, so my call to action would be to make health a permanent priority going forward in this new Africa-Euro partnership. Because uh, like I said, health underpins everything that we're talking about. Our health systems, our economies, our social activities. Or, I mean, countries have gone into second lockdowns as we speak. Uh, so many families have really been affected and pushed lower down the poverty line. So getting our health systems to work, realizing that we're only as strong as our weakest health link, and in that way, we can be able to prepare for future health threats going forward. Health as a permanent priority. Thank you. All right, yeah. Anna, your call to action. Thank you, Kenneth. I absolutely agree with Obina that health has to be, health and education have to be the central pillars in the EU Africa partnership. So I would call on European leaders to increase the budget in the development assistance for health from the current just 2% to a much higher sum, as well as call to African leaders to increase their budget to 15% as well, because as we discussed in this panel, explicitly health is such an important issue and it's really connected to everything that we do. And if we don't invest in health, we're gonna feel the impact of it very much. Thank you. 
Mm, interesting, yeah. and uh, and um, uh, Damilola. Uh, for me, I will call on um, European and African leaders to be committed to ending extreme poverty. Uh, no child should go to bed uh, without dinner or without knowing what you will eat the following day. Uh, if you are poor, you cannot access health, you cannot access education, you cannot uh, even access digital technologies. Uh, it, the poverty for me is a big issue and an underlying uh, factor for most of the problems that we're dealing with. And we have to address this, um, LP. All right, the, poverty the consequences of poverty could, could really how we're going down. to move forward and address this. But then, it's one thing to have informed young people here talking about, you know, how they can engage in the future. But how do you get this to, you know, to create that traction that we need to get more young people like yourself care about the future of the Africa Union um, Europe Partnership? Let me start with Ellen on uh, why it's important to, to get this, uh, to galvanize this movement, to get more young people in, interested in understanding the dynamics of this new partnership. Um, thank you, Kenneth. Well, I'd say young people need to realize that this is the future being shaped for them, not just through this partnership, but this partnership set in stones, a lot of future relations between both continents. Um, so understanding that this could be an opportunity in enormous progress in terms of job creation. We're going to have a very important unemployment crisis after, um, after COVID. We need to build back. How are we going to build that? These are all very important questions and this partnership could actually address some of these questions and this concerns everyone's lives on both continents. Um, also in terms of addressing climate change, addressing future security issues. Um, so I think once they see, once young people see actually that other youth are being given a voice, they become interested, they become thinking, how does this affect my life? Um, so I think it's the role of politicians, it's a role of any civil organization, it's particularly the role of youth organizations to spread that message that this is not something that just concerns politicians, but this will concern our everyday life. Thank you. Okay, yes. Um, so what I think that we can do to get more young people involved is to first of all, educate them they need to be educated. So education actually goes hand in hand with health, basically. So when you have more young people educated, and of course they need to be healthy to be able to go to school, then that way you can therefore sort of like uh, build traction and, and have a, a, a larger critical mass of young people who are aware of what is needed. Education is, is the catalyst. It, 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 it enlightens the mind. It makes people tend to see problems differently and to solve them in a very, very efficient and modern way. So we need more people to be educated, basically. And, and that is the way that we can actually tap into our demographic dividend, considering that young people make up the majority of sub-Saharan African population. So tapping into this, in this uh, young people resource is very critical. They need to be aware from a younger age how all of this that we're talking about connects with them, how the, the, the mothers who want to give birth can be able to receive healthcare because there is a primary healthcare center close by, which is not far away, and they don't need to spend more. They understand that because there's a health facility, they don't usually, they, they don't really need to give birth at home or through a traditional birth, birth attendant that is unskilled. So th this, is, this is what we're talking about, increasing the education and of course the health education of people can be able to bring about this critical mass that we're talking about and therefore get more youth involved. And of course, that feeds into what Damilola says about electro electoral processes being strengthened as well. The more young people are aware about what politicians are saying and how that, how that can actually uh, affect them specifically in their lives will go a long way to helping them define their decisions going forward. Thank you. All right, Anna, let me get your thoughts on how we can, why we should get more young people involved in this partnership. The answer to this is very simple. Like everyone already said, this, in, this is going to impact youth. This partnership is going to impact youth. It's going to impact youth unemployment. It's going to impact health. It's going to impact climate crisis. And the youth 
has a voice in this and it needs to have a voice in this. So this is why it's incredibly important for all kinds of organizations, private, public, to recognize this and involve youth in whatever they're doing to make sure that they can shape their own future. Thank you. All right, then, and I'm afraid that's all the time. We have a very interesting viewpoint and perspectives put forward that I'd love to get to hear uh, Damian Lola's comment, but I'm afraid that's all the time that we have so far, but interesting coverage that we've had so far. I thank you so much for being a part of it. My guest so far have been Obina Onwa, he's a public uh, health professional and one activist. We also have Anna Nippenberg, she's a master's student in economics, and also Dami Lola Adeniro, is a writer and policy advocate. And last but definitely not the least, we have Eleanor Bartile, she's an MA candidate in international affairs. And thank you so much for watching. <laughs>